Welcome back to the McCann Dogs Podcast, episode 15. And if you are between uh, training and uh, uh, moving to a world where you don't have to train all the time every single day, then you might be thinking about removing some of your dog training tools. I don't know. Did that work? It worked. Okay. I loved it. You right, nailed it. Good, good. Um, so uh, <laughs> what we're going to talk about today is removing dog training tools. And uh, when we talk about this kind of thing, this is ultimately what you're working towards. This is where you want to get with your dog uh, so that you you aren't dependent on tools. Mm -hmm. Any tool we introduce into our dog training is something that we are working away from. We don't want to become dependent on any one thing. Yeah. But I think that might, for a lot of people, they might think of like a specific kind of gentle leader collar or a specific thing that they might use in their training. And, and actually, Shannon, your idea of dog training tools includes a lot more than that. Let's talk about you what bet. some of the um, you know, top of mind training tools are when we talk about dog training tools. Yeah. <laughs> Well said. <laughs> Anything that helps you control your dog so that you can get them information in a good way is a training tool. Be that a leash, be that a piece of food, be that your bait pouch, be it a gentle leader, a, a crate. All these things are training tools. They can be a little bit management tools versus training tools, but basically these are all things that help you keep your dog safe until you have complete verbal control. Yeah, all of the management tools, you know, we often refer to these as, as management tools. When we talk about something like a crate, mm -hmm. a lot of people wouldn't think of that as a training tool, but boy, oh boy, it oh, could be the most huge. impactful training tool that you use. Yeah. So when do you start to remove these things? And and what happens when you remove them too soon mm -hmm. or you give your dog a little bit too much freedom? That's exactly what we're going to talk about in today's show. So Let's talk about, um, I mean, I just mentioned crates and I mentioned that that might be one of the most important tools that we yeah. use as a, uh, when, when I came to McCann Dogs, I hadn't been using a crate with Deegan uh, and she was um, a little bit old, she was two, year, two years old, a little bit less than two. And uh, one of the first things that we talked about in classes was like, you know, how to manage your dog better. And if your dog's making mistake after mistake after mistake, what are you mm -hmm. going to do about it? And if, you know, if you're looking to really give you, give yourself some, uh, I don't know, peace of mind, using a crate is a great way to do that. Uh, and when I did that right away, I noticed some big changes. I wasn't saying, Hey, get out of there. Oh, no, don't do that. Which was what I was doing all the time mm -hmm. before, before I, I, I implemented using a crate. Let's talk about why a crate is so important as a management tool. Yeah, you bet. So as a management tool, it keeps your dog safe when you can't be there supervising them. And as you just said, you know, Deegan was two before you started crate training. So it is never too late. We can always provide this nice, safe space for our dogs. And dogs being denning creatures, it's a very natural thing for them. Lots of dogs as youngsters will protest the crate. But if you introduce it in a nice way and you help them feel safe and secure in it, it is going to be a wonderful thing for them for the entirety of their lives. And you might not need it as a management tool. Once they understand the rules of the house, they'll be safe to be out loose in the house in most cases if you've you know done your job done your job training them and made sure that they understand those rules but you never know when you might need to kennel your dog or when you might need to leave them overnight at a vet you know if there's something wrong that comes up medically i will always make sure that my dogs and i mean my lifestyle means that they're in their crates all the time anyways they come to work with me they travel in crates in the car they hang out in their crates at work um they don't spend much time in their crates at home anymore. But if I didn't have that travel to work part and the time at work part, I would make sure they did spend time in their crates at home so that they were still very comfortable with it. So if those those situations ever come up where I needed to offload my dog with somebody to take care of for a little while, or I needed to leave one of my dogs at the vet, I know they're going to be safe and comfortable in that crate. When we, uh, I was talking to our vet, um, the, I don't know, maybe a couple of months ago and uh, she was interested. She wanted, there's some things that you'll see coming on, out on her YouTube channel and actually a, a podcast that she wanted to talk about with us. But she mentioned that um, she'd had a couple of McCann Dog students in there. I forget what the was going on with their maybe routine assessment or whatever, but she knew that um, those people, because she's actually taken our course as well, but she knew that those people, their dogs were comfortable in their crate. Their, their dogs were comfortable being handled. And in a situation like a vet appointment, it's already stressful, you Absolutely. know, especially if it's an emergency of some kind. If your dog needs to be left overnight or whatever for several hours, you want them to understand that being in a crate is a comfortable, safe 
thing. Yes. And uh, I mean, the benefits of that, but you know, uh, we introduced the crate very early on. We introduced it with our students, with our own dogs training. We know the value uh, that it has. But at some point, you want to be able to not be dependent on the crate. You, you know, bet. leave your dog out of the crate. So w w what would be that transitional process with going from like, uh, unless you're supervising the dogs in their crate, to giving them a little giving them a little bit more freedom. Yeah. It's usually a longer process than most people think. I think most people underestimate the amount of time that they will want to use their crate before allowing the dog to be free in the house. And if you think about the way we transition with distractions and all sorts of things, that's the same thing that we want to do with our dogs. We want to think about giving them freedom as sort of a ladder and an escalation process where we offer them a little bit where it's there's a fail safe in place, you know, and my dog's out of their crate and I'm supervising, the fail safe is that I'm watching and I can stop them from getting into mischief. If I remove myself from that situation, I've removed that fail safe. But if I do it slowly, I can check on progress and I can make sure that things go well. So for example, the first time I leave my dogs out of their crate unsupervised might just be when I go to the bathroom. You know, sure. it might be that short of a period of time. And I'm rushing, <laughs> even at that, I'm rushing to get out of the bathroom quick to make sure that they haven't gotten into any mischief. Or I might go and take a very quick shower, or I might walk outside of the house and walk around the house and walk back in. I am not going to go from having my dog in the crate sort of full time when they're not supervised to then going out for an hour or two and just crossing my fingers and hoping for the best. Mm -hmm. I don't want to leave that huge amount of time where my dog has the opportunity to think about being bored, to explore things they might not be exploring if I wasn't there, and then ultimately to maybe get into mischief or get hurt or do something that uh, is harmful to themselves or the house. I want to make sure that it's little, little fits and spurts. You know, with Ned, for example, uh, he was probably... I want to say close to a year before I even thought about leaving him unsupervised. And that's not to say that he wasn't alone in the house for periods of time as I was in other rooms. But as far as like actually leaving him loose in the house, I don't think I thought about that until he was about a year old. And literally the first time was when I took Reggie for a very quick walk around the block. I left and let Ned loose in the house. I came back. Everything was hunky dory. So then the next time it was two two blocks yep. for Reggie and I came back and everything was good. The thing that we know as dog trainers is to adjust immediately when something goes wrong. And I think this is something that sometimes people just hope that it doesn't happen again. Hopefully this is a one off thing. I you know, they can't they come home they find a shoe that's been chewed and they go, oh, I really hope that doesn't happen again. So I'm going to put all the shoes up high so my dog can't get at them. And then I'm going to try it again. And they go to work for an eight hour day and they come back and something else has been chewed. And what happens is the dog gets into a pattern of being left alone, having whatever emotional process they're having with that, whether they have a nap first and then wake up and realize they're bored or whether they get stressed out right off the bat and start looking for things to satiate that stress. Basically, they are going to at some point get into a pattern. That's what we don't want to do. So if I had taken Reggie for a walk around the block, come back home, and Ned had gotten into any mischief in that 10 minutes that I was gone, I wouldn't be trying that again for a while. I wouldn't be trying that again until the next time I thought, I can't remember when this dog has put a foot out of line again, then I'm going to try that walk around the block for five minutes again. And it's it's all about, you know, cause and effect. I want to make sure that I'm reacting to the situation as it unfolds. I'm not letting my dog get to the point where now the pattern is I go to work for eight hours and he immediately starts chewing on baseboards because that's just what he does when he's alone. Right. Yeah. I think that's a really important way to look at it. And as a dog trainer, we know this is the best way to give your dog the best information mm -hmm. is uh, to, to sort of introduce these things slowly. Um, so the crate is one example. You know, if, if things went awry, I, I love that you mentioned you'd allow something and, or you'd manage or monitor something until you couldn't remember the last time your dog made a mistake. Yeah. I think that's a really good benchmark for a lot of people to have. I can't remember the last time my dog jumped on this thing or whatever, you know, to, chewed a shoe when they were out of their crate. I can't remember the last time that happened. Well, maybe it is time. Maybe you can give them a little bit more freedom and then figure out uh, from there. But it is a done dynamic process. You bet. You know, if your dog makes a mistake, uh, commonly we'll see people say, my dog hasn't you know, peed in the house for so much time. And then all of a sudden they have an accident. Well, what are, we, what are you going to do about that? I, you know, often people would think like, oh, this is a one-off. I hope this doesn't happen again. 
we, what you should do is manage, monitor, uh, supervise yeah. a little bit more so that it can happen again. And uh, I, this is where, this is really where, as a listener, your dog training brain gets turned on right now. And, and you can really think about uh, all of the little mistakes that happen throughout your day that a little bit of supervision will fix. Yeah, you bet. make a huge difference. Huge. And, yeah, and the, and the crate is such a great way to manage the time because you can't supervise 100%, but manage the time when you aren't able to be mm-hmm. a, a dog trainer. So the next one I want to talk about is the leash yes. and why that's such a good training tool. The leash is a, a, you know, you might not think of that as a training tool, but boy, oh boy, it's a good one as well as something like the house line. I think we could probably talk about both you of bet. these in here. Absolutely. They are both very, very important for success. And a lot of the times people don't think of a leash as a training aid and it is, it is probably one of your most important training aids. I know we already said that about crates, but we're going to say it again about leashes. Yeah. Too. Leashes and house lines and having a means of getting control of your puppy. Because the thing is, or your dog, the thing is they're faster than us. They have two more legs than we do. We're already behind the eight ball before we even get up out of bed in the morning. So we need to set ourselves up for success. And practice makes perfect. And that is true of whatever it is your dog is practicing. So if your dog is practicing stealing things and playing keep away with you, that is being perfected as they are practicing it. They're getting better and better at that. So if on the other hand, your dog grabbed a sock, went to run for the hills, and you just calmly reached out and put your foot on the house line that they were dragging and stopped that situation from escalating or recurring, right there, you have prevented your dog from learning that it is fun to play keep away. And, you know, it becomes bratty behavior from a human perspective, but from the dog's perspective, they're just engaging with in a game with you. They're saying, you know what? I want to play with this thing. I know that when I grab this thing, you chase me and that's fun. Yeah. I want you to chase me. If you watch dogs playing with one another, the dog that's being chased is usually the one making the rules. So it's not that they're bad dogs. They just think this is, these are the rules of their play and they're, they're being true to their species. They're using those rules in our world and they're not convinced in our world. So if we have ourselves set up so that we can just stop that, we can nip it in the bud, we can basically say, this is not a fun game, but guess what? Here's a funner game. I have a toy. Come play with me with this toy. We'll teach them to retrieve. We'll teach them to tug. We'll teach them to play. We just did a, a episode last week on tugging, if you want to go back and check that one out. So, you know, it, it, taking the instincts of the dog to want to play and entertain and have fun and engage with you, like this is actually a good thing that your dog's wanting to play with you. We just want to make sure that they're rules that we want them to follow. They're convenient rules for us. I, I think... Um... As we talk about this more, leash, long line, house line, this applies to all three of those things. Yep. And the one thing I immediately recognize is that we have high expectations of our dogs. We have high expectations of our students' dogs because we know they are capable of it. I mean, McCann yep. Dogs has helped more than 100,000 people in, that, in our training building. Yeah to have a dog that loves to listen. And we've seen it for everybody that says, oh, you know, they don't listen because they're a beagle or they don't, he doesn't want to whatever, fetch because he's a terrier, whatever, whatever your excuse Mm -hmm. is. I will tell you that we have seen hundreds of dogs of a, of that breed who are more than capable of accomplishing. You're either going to make excuses or you're going to make changes. And these are the kinds of changes that, that, you know, that are going to make a, Shannon made a face there. If you can, if you're watching the podcast, I'm like, preach. Yeah. (laughs) But, but that's what really what it comes down to. And, and um, make some of those changes that you're making are, are dependent on these training tools and yeah. and how you in, how you start to move away from them but also maybe you have to bring things back you know pull, pull the reins in a little bit mm-hmm. um, so leash long line house line all of those things so. yeah and we end up creating two sets of rules when we don't use training aids effectively so as an example with the leash and this is so crucial don't take the leash off until you know your dog is going to listen to your voice because as soon as you do they start to learn that you can't take control in some situations And this, it gives them an opportunity to say, you know what, I'm going to find my own fun then. And instead of listening to you and engaging back with you, they go and take off and go and chase the dog at the other end of the park with you madly running behind them, yelling, no, stop, come. And the dog learns that, you know what, you can't take control in that situation. They can ignore you. They can run to the other side of the park, which 
might be across a busy road. You know, it, it basically creates a situation where your dog knows that they don't always have to listen. Whereas if you set up with the leash, don't take it off until you know you've got good verbal control. And if you teach things like response to name and recall, you can have excellent control with your dogs and a great way of getting them back to you in relatively quick fashion. Yeah. And then what we do rather than just taking off the leash is we have them drag a long line and we don't use it you know, unless we need it. So it's it's just there. It can be a little bit of a pain in the neck. I totally get that. Our students say it gets tangled around them, et cetera. I know I, I, it happens with my own dogs as well, but when I need to take control, if my dog decides there's a squirrel and he's gonna go running after that squirrel, I can stop him. And I can prevent that lesson from happening. I can prevent him from learning that sometimes he doesn't have to listen. And that is worth its weight in gold because if he practices not listening, that's what becomes perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, something that as you're, we were talking about uh, uh, the dog not responding to name or uh, coming when they're called, I think one of the common things that we know students struggle with is walking on leash and having the right equipment, something that, uh, you know, is built to transition off of can be really helpful. You bet. There's uh, lots of schools of thought on what sort of equipment you should use and something we love for those dogs. We start on a flat buckle collar. You know, that's where, that's a good foundation. That's mm -hmm. a good starting point. Flat buckle collar that's, you know, adjustable and maybe some decent, um, you know, uh, buckle on it so that it's not going to slip and slide. But for those dogs that need a little bit more, mm -hmm. there's a tool that we like called the gentle leader. You bet. And what I love about the gentle leader, because uh, for my own dogs as well as students' dogs, um, it, it, it is the way that it's built to transition off of it so that you don't, you don't need it versus something, you know, there's like a halty, there's like other brands that don't share those features and functions. And, and what I love about the gentle leader is that you, it's, it's basically, if you don't know what that is, it's like a nose loop. It's what also got the, like the neck loop. It looks, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a face, it's a head halter, mm -hmm. but um, uh, it, it's built so that you can slip that nose loop off when your dog's starting to be successful. So let's talk about training collars and how people can transition away from them uh, or when they, when they should. Yeah, you bet. And the best way to teach your dog anything is to first take them out of situations where there's any sort of distraction. So you should be able to start your dog with things like walking on leash inside the house, then move to the backyard, then move to the front yard, then start moving down the street a little bit. You know, same idea as with anything. We want to make sure that we're doing this gradually so that we're gradually asking our dog to contend with all this stimulus in the environment and all this distraction, but still focus on us instead of following their instinct. So we want to make sure that we're being as fair as possible to the dog. A gentle leader allows you to get out and live life without having to worry about rehearsing the pulling thing because you can easily stop pulling on a gentle leader. Um, we don't, there's a, there's all sorts of gimmicky things out there on the market, the yeah. no pull harnesses and whatnot. We don't have any brand of no pull harness that we're willing to recommend. There's all sorts of research still up in the air about them, but basically um, the research suggests that damage over time will happen. Personally, I'm of that belief as well. You'll have to decide for yourself, but we like head halters over and above any sort of, um, uh, harness having control of the head. I mean, the head, the body goes where the head goes. You bet. So, so having control of the head, especially for those dogs that are really enthusiastic and energetic and love to pull. Absolutely, um, being able to guide them from the front, the front to back is really helpful. Yeah, you bet. And it's a nice light touch of control. Yeah. And then as you mentioned, there's that halfway point with the gentle leader, which is why we prefer that particular brand. And we're not sponsored by gentle leader. No. It's just our preference. And as dog trainers, it gives us this opportunity to wean away from it rather than just going from all, all to nothing. So that halfway point where you slip the nose loop up, off and it becomes a high riding flat buckle collar basically with a little bit more control, it's a really nice way to transition away from it. Basically with any tool like a gentle leader, once I have beautiful walking, you know, if I've got my, my dogs, when we're walking through the neighborhood, they don't have to heal and look at me with rapt attention, but they have to maintain position and they're not allowed to stop and sniff and pee on things because I have boys and we would never get anywhere <laughs> if I let them stop and sniff and pee on everything. I am also very particular about not letting my dogs pee on my uh, neighbor's bushes, et cetera. We make sure that we get to the park and the public property before I let them lift their legs on things. And then sure. they can have freedom and enjoy themselves. And, you know, they can pee on whatever they want. But when we're walking, <laughs> I expect them to be in that nice, you know, heel position, mm -hmm. but fairly casual at my side. Yeah. At the point where I have that behavior, I'll start to think about weeding off training aids. So I'll do it with 
with conscious effort to pay attention to the distractions in the environment though. So for example, if I am in the city center and there's a ton of stuff going on around me, that's probably not the time where I'm first going to try slipping the nose piece off the yeah. gentle leader. Even yeah. if I think, oh, he's been really great out in sort of a quieter setting on the in the suburbs and on the sidewalk. So I'm going to start my transition there in the quiet environment. I'm going to see how he does. I'm going to build some value for walking in heel position without that gentle leader on. And then I'll reassess from there. I might go to a tougher location for my next training session, or I might take the gentle leader completely off in that first training session where he did great with just the nose loop off. So think about the interim steps. Try not to think about when you're weaning off of training aids, think about the weaning process, not just removing it. Think about weaning. When we're talking about, um, you're talking specifically about like our let's go walking with the dog in at your side. Um, uh, for, for me, uh, one of my, I think one of the most useful tools that we have is um, leash respect. Mm -hmm. And something that we talk a lot about in like our life skills with our life skills students online and, and our grade one students in the training school. Um, when I see the dog start to recognize, to choose, to put in effort to keep that leash loose, that's, I feel like a transitional point you know if i have a, if the dog's on a gentle leader i might go to the the neck loop mm -hmm. you know, like to the to, to, it turns it into basically a tiny flat buckle collar you know if i see the dog start to put in effort maybe that's when i can give them a little bit more leash uh, you know is is the moment they feel the pressure basically what we teach is that when your dog feels pressure on the leash they mm -hmm. They re re reduce that pressure. They move closer to you so that that leash isn't tight. And um, this is outside of heel position. Uh, yeah, outside okay. of heel position. They can be anywhere around you. And, and that's why I think it's such a functional skill. And that's why I oh, think it's great. so important for our life skills uh, online students, as well as our grade one students to learn it, because this is the one that I use all the time. When we're in town, when we're anywhere and I have mm -hmm. the dog on a leash, I want them to not be pulling me in, in any direction, yeah. just to be able to move around freely and they don't have to be in that tight uh, uh, position at your left side with rapt attention, as you yeah. mentioned. You bet. But when I see them, my, that dog start to understand or start to like really, you know, they, they hit the end of the leash because, you know, maybe I've stopped walking and they didn't notice they hit the end of the leash and they just check in, hit the brakes and check in with me. Yeah. I know that that's a transitional time for this dog in this in, in stage in their training. Yeah. And, and that's a great thing to acknowledge. You know, when our dogs start to offer these things on their own, when they start to be more responsible for their own behavior, that is a great opportunity to really reinforce those things so that you continue to build value in that direction. But yeah, I love that as a benchmark to start thinking about weaning off of a training aid or making things a little bit more challenging. We never want to stagnate in our training. That's right. what I think a lot of the times that's a good misunderstanding that people fall on is that they have to keep doing the same thing over and over again. And we just want to do that thing until we get the result. And then we need to throw a little bit more challenge at it. So me practicing let's go in front of my house or healing in front of my house back and forth for three months and adding no distractions mm -hmm. or no anything is never going to help me progress and yeah. get to the point where I can walk through the town center with my dog in heel position and, and nicely under control. So understanding and effort it seems like those two things when when we start to see that uh you, you know it, it's really uh, uh, for me it's it's what i enjoy about dog training when you see the dog say okay i i get it now i'm starting to get yeah. it I, what you want and you know here i can i can work even harder you know like, even around those tough distractions the uh reflex or, or the uh, the first thing the dog is check in with you yeah. i love the team oh 100 percent. those moments are incredible whether it's your yeah. dog's or a student's when you, you know, somebody comes in with this wild, uh, you know, whatever, uh, Akita uh, in a grade one class and they're, you know, it's a lot of dog and the student seems overwhelmed. And then, you know, uh, eight weeks later, they're walking on a loose leash in at the, in at the handler's side, you know, around all these great, oh, it's what a rewarding thing. But those understanding that uh, that didn't happen overnight yeah. and um, that there was a lot of effort that went into that. But if, you know, if that meant going that the dog started on a gentle leader and maybe at the end of eight weeks, the dog's still on a gentle leader because that's what the dog needs right now. You bet. That's, that's okay. Absolutely. That's not just okay. That is productive yes. and helpful for the dog. It shows the dog good empathy. Yeah. You know, if you have an expectation in place and you want them to meet that expectation, it shows that you are sensitive to the fact that you need to be 
be gentle about getting to that point. You yeah. know, we don't want to just cream our dogs and make them heal at our side. We want them to enjoy the process of learning and we want them to enjoy being with us. We don't want them to just be there because they know they have to. I think that's a com common misconception people have. And even people who, you know, maybe are going through, um, some of our programs and they, you know, uh, it's recommended that they redo grade two, for mm -hmm. example. And they're like, well, I mean, we did grade two, but, you know, I'd like to move on. Um, again, as a dog trainer, as someone who's seen however many dogs I've seen, I know that what's best for that dog might be yeah. to reinforce, you know, uh, this set of skills. Because once you, once you unlock the recall or the stay, it's going to make everything easier. Absolutely. You know, I, I mean, I'm sort of arbitrarily picking skills, but mm -hmm. there, there are lots of situations where a certain dog needs a certain exercise that will change everything for yeah. them. Well, and our grade two program is the program we start to teach extreme verbal control and you know basically the entire grade two program is done without the leash in your hand it's yeah. there dragging on the ground as a safety break but it's not to be used unless you absolutely need to stop the dog it's always voice first then a little bit of touch so that transition is huge yeah. that's basically taking your dog from a point where they're on leash listening all the time to off leash so it's a huge transition and sometimes it takes a little bit of time for sure um just i, I, I want to let everyone know in case this is your first time with us here on the podcast that uh if you're looking for some advice some guidance through your training process maybe you need to know what that thing is that your dog's missing what that skill is that you really need to double down on we have a puppy essentials uh, uh, program online for dogs under five months and a life skills program for dogs five months and older that uh, would talk uh, our life skills programs a little bit more about like the recall walking on leash sit and stay as well as a bunch of other um, you know necessary skills for your dogs to have uh, but I'll, I'll drop a link in the show notes below so you can check out our online programs uh, in case you'd, you'd like to get daily feedback on your training you know you you want to submit video of your last training exercise so you can have a dog trainer break it down and say here's where you went wrong here's what went so great and also if you want a community of like-minded dog owners who want to have a dog that can do better, can do more, can, you know, love to listen. Mm -hmm. That's really what I love about the community. Our Wednesday wins is coming up and I love seeing that. All the people that send in their pictures. I can pictures hear you and, smiling. Oh, I know. <laughs> I can't help it because it's so much fun when you see this list of people who have had all these wins because I remember when I was that dog owner, when I was like, yeah. oh, this is the worst. I didn't want to go to dog training, to be honest. I just didn't, I didn't want to do it. I, it was another thing. It would be a lot. But when I got here and I saw the transformation, it changed my understanding of dogs. And then uh, I was around here so much because I love dog training. At, at that point, I just fell in love with the process. And I was around <laughs> here so much to ask me to become a trainer. So I was like, well, this is the best thing that could have ever happened. And so I then... did my apprenticeship. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and I mean, years later, uh, look, look where I am now. Fell in love with some other things That's around right. here. That's right. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. You know, I don't know. It, you know, I do get so excited about this because I, this is the, it, this is the program that I would have taken, I think, if, uh, if it were so many years ago. Um, <clears throat> and I, I just know that it can really change your life. The amount of people that, uh, that reach out to us saying like, how much they love the program and mm -hmm. how much it's changed their relationship with their dog. So, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. sort of, I'm going on about it and I don't mean to, but I get excited about it. I know. It. It's so fulfilling for us though, totally. too. And like yeah. the Wednesday wins when oh. we're like troubleshooting with some of our students. Okay, let's try this this time. Okay, how about right. try this for a day? Yeah. And then we get a Wednesday win where it's yes. success. Absolutely. Yes. Totally. <laughs> it's so great to celebrate along with them. Well, one of the things we talk a lot about in those programs is treats. For puppies, you know, we start using lots of treats in their training with the goal, the end goal of not needing treats for everything to happen. In Absolutely. life skills, it's a process of using lots of treats, using treats up front and then working away from treats. Also, treats are also a training tool. These are you some bet. of the things that you want to be thinking about. How can I work away from this? Because we don't want to become dependent on any one training tool. Absolutely. And we did a podcast episode a couple of weeks ago about bribe versus reward in food. So that'll be a good one to go back and listen to for very specifics on weaning away from food. But basically the idea with food training is that you have more systems of reward than just food. Um, and that comes with learning about your dog. You know, with Ned, anything water related is a reward for that dog. So for example, if I wanted to do some recall work around a body of water, I could 
call him to come and as he's running towards me, yell yes and go swim. And that would be a huge reward for him. It doesn't always have to be food. It doesn't always have to be toys. Um, but weaning away from food comes with the challenge of replacing that reward with something else. And it has to be something the dog finds valuable. So you might think, oh, good boy is a valuable reward. But if your dog doesn't see any value in that, it won't be a good reward for them. And using it with a behavior will eventually cause that behavior to fade because it's not being reinforced. So figure out what your dog does like. Um, if you've listened to the podcast before, you've heard me talk about Ned and butt scratches. One of his all-time favorite rewards is to have his butt scratched. He doesn't like his head touched, so it's not a reward <laughs> for him for me to pet his head. But he loves a good butt scratch, so... A lot of the times if I call his name and he comes running towards me happily, sometimes he gets a butt scratch. Sometimes he gets a good boy and a pat on the side because at this point in our lives, that is a valuable thing for him and it will cause his tail to wag and him to be happy when I'm happy with him. But that's a lot of time genuinely celebrating with him, building value for exercises, building value for the expectations that I have, and then transferring that value from food and toys to the butt scratches, to the pats on the side, to the good girl, good boy, et cetera. What's more, even more important in my mind, and I know we are definitely talking about the things we're rewarding with, but what's more, even more important that I sort of uncovered as a, as a, a knowing dog owner was timing mm -hmm. and how important timing is. And that is truly the only way you're going to transition away from requiring treats. The amount of people that say on our YouTube comments or somewhere, well, this is great, but my dog only listens when I have food in my hand. Well, I will tell you that is because your timing isn't right. Yeah. Yeah, go back and listen to that bribe versus reward yeah. episode because it'll it'll nail down some of the specifics of why your timing might not be right and how to fix those things. But basically, once we have conditioned another reinforcer, like the word yes we use in our training, we can follow it up with whatever we want. It doesn't have to be food. So there's, there's a, a transition from food where we use food to show, and then we very quickly want to remove the food as a lure or a means of showing the dog and make it a reward so that it comes after we have marked the correct behavior with yes. So in the example of response to name, if I said Ned and he turned around and looked at me, I would be able to mark with yes, which tells him he's right. He knows very clearly that that means he's right. And I can follow it up with whatever I want at that point. That could be my good girl. You know, Ned's four now. So there, I don't call him a girl, but I could. I could say good girl, yeah, yeah. way to go. Really, it doesn't matter what Absolutely. you say. Absolutely, it's yeah. just a reward at that point. And it's valuable enough to him, I know that the butt scratch, the, uh, you know, if he's running towards me and I just, I just move my legs apart so he can run through my legs to yeah. something behind me, that's incredibly valuable for him as well. If I call his name and he turns, I'll sometimes throw a Frisbee, you know, after marking with yes. You can have any reward system that you want as long as the dog agrees that it's a reward. We will often, Kale and I will be out for a walk with our dogs and um, we'll have brought some treats with us. And mm -hmm. our dogs are all older now. And uh, I guess Euchre would be the youngest. She's still on a house line. We generally don't walk her with the other dogs because the other dogs get to run and be free. And there's, you know, it gets pretty intense. So we don't want to, whatever. But um, so the one thing we do do is with our older dogs, we bring some treats with us and occasionally we'll just call them and reward them for yeah. coming in to reinforce, you know, although they don't require treats to, to, to do that skill to make that work. We want to reinforce them occasionally, even long after we've uh, transitioned away from having to reward everything. Yeah, you bet. I, I try to reward voluntary stuff as much as I can. Yeah. So in that example, you know, the dogs will often check in with us because they're used to taking information from us. They're used to wanting to engage with us. You know, that's one of the side effects of training is that dogs learn to communicate back with us as well. And it's not just all about them finding their own fun. It's about them telling us what they need and what they want as well. So a lot of the times my, our dogs will come and check in with us and that's a great opportunity to just say yes. And then either pull out a toy and have a little play before sending them back on their way or yes, pull out a piece of food, you know, randomly every once in a while with Ned. Actually, Reggie, this is a really valuable thing with Reggie because it allows me to still be able to walk him in safe areas mm -hmm. off leash as a deaf dog. He's yeah. 13 years old now and he's stone deaf at this point. And 
if I hadn't spent his whole life basically reinforcing him for coming in and checking me out when we're on our hikes, etc., he probably would just do his own thing. But because he's in the habit of checking in with me, as long as I'm in like the McCann property, for example, where it's fully fenced and I know that, you know, even if I did have to run after him to give him a touch and say, hey, deaf dog, pay attention <laughs> yeah. to me, he's not going to get hurt in any way. So I will still be able to let him off leash in these situations knowing that he's going to check in with me and he's going to basically toddle along behind me for most of the walk and he's safe, but he can still enjoy that freedom. Now I have gone to letting him drag a long line at this point again, just to make sure, you know, if he's ever far away and I need to get his attention, I can just give a little tug on that line yeah, to get yeah. his focus back on me because of the deafness. Lots of people will use pager callers as well. I just haven't gotten into that with him yet, but that's always a viable option with a, with a deaf dog that I've been thinking about. Yeah. I've had a couple of deaf dogs before. <laughs> yeah, I know. Actually, we have a video on our YouTube channel uh, with Squishy. Squishy. Uh, where you, we were showing some uh, recall with a deaf dog. And I know some people ask for that. So you can check out our YouTube channel for something like that. I'll I, have to I, do I, another one with uh, Reggie. Now. Yeah, that's a good idea. Update. Maybe that could be, that's, yeah, that's a good idea. We can record that. Um, because the title of this podcast is Removing the Training Aids too soon. Mm -hmm. um, what does the average dog owner see from their dog if they've removed treats out of the picture too fast? you will see the behavior start to slide. So basically there's this thing called transfer of value that happens when we ask our dogs for a sit, for example, and we pattern the idea that they sit and we reward them, they sit and we reward them. And then we go to a random reinforcement schedule. So we're not, we're not feeding them every single time. But basically what happens is the value transfers from the food to the behavior. So eventually when you say sit, the dog wants to sit because it's been reinforced so many times before. If you don't put in enough time and repetition and get in enough rewards to hit the point where the behavior itself becomes valuable, it will start to decrease in value. And actually that will happen regardless. If you just suddenly stop all rewards, eventually your yeah. sit will become something that the dog goes, eh, maybe, yeah. eh, it's not really worth my while. Dogs do what's rewarding. They do what's valuable. So if you keep those things valuable with even just enthusiastic praise once you're at that point is going to be enough for a lot of dogs to say, oh, yeah, sitting is still a valuable thing. It's still great. Yeah. And going back, you know, rather than just pulling out a treat, you know, after you don't get the response you want, if you go back, set up the situation, know that you're training, uh, you'll have better timing. Ooh, yes. That's a really good point. So yeah, if you said sit and your dog didn't sit and then you pulled out a treat and said sit again, that is exactly why your, your dog, dog is training you. Oh yeah. Your dog only does it when you have food because the first time they didn't see the value in the situation, they waited and you brought the value out. Now here's the value proposition in my hand. Now you can sit knowing that you're going to get the cookie. That really gets those wheels turning with not only with understanding where the value is, but also with queuing systems for the dog. Yeah. It's a little bit, uh, actually a lot, unfair to assume that the dog can figure out how to sit or whatever based on just the verbal cue. If you've not put in enough time and effort, they might not understand that verbal cue by itself without seeing that food in your hand. So that's another way that it kind of creates a little bit of a monster. Absolutely. Now, I hope we've helped you guys to really um, understand uh, why it's important to have a strategy, have a plan when it comes to removing training aids. Mm -hmm. And to know that you might be looking at this saying like, oh my gosh, I removed this thing too soon. What on earth do I do? It's as simple as taking a step back. It's no different yeah. than training a skill. You know, you, uh, if you feel like you're, you're losing some of that skill or the speed of that skill, or that you've had one unsuccessful day where your dog had an accident in the house or chewed on a shoe, you take a step back. And, uh, this is no different when it comes to training tools. Um, on that note, I think that was a fun one. And uh, I want to thank you guys for joining us make sure you check out the show notes below and, uh, you can subscribe to us on uh, our YouTube. If you're watching the YouTube podcast or hit the follow button on whatever platform we are on. I know we are on a lot We're of them. We're on the ball. <laughs> but I want to thank you guys for joining us. On that note, I'm Ken. I'm Shannon. Happy training, guys. Bye for now. Bye, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the McCann Dogs podcast. And if you'd like some more training resources, be sure to check us out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook at McCann Dogs. And if you'd like to train with us online, be sure to check out the show notes below for our My Dog Can online training program, where we know in just a few weeks, your dog will become a well-behaved family member. Until then, happy training.